The people of Judah was were hearing Isaiah say that the end is coming. It's already started. Buckle up. And they celebrated. Oh, what? Why are you? <gasps> That's God. That is God. That is God. I'm literally sweating. That's what that's what happens when you celebrate when the Lord is talking to you serious. I'm telling you, stop messing around. Or maybe that's the Lord talking to me, like stop being so jokey jokey. Ooh. Hey father, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. So, what story are we getting into today? All right, all right, all right. I can do that. I'm the girl for the job. Call back later. <gasps> you guys, this week, we're going to be talking about how God works. Mm, welcome to another episode of Bible Stories with me, Brianda. Brianda. And joining me, none other than the Spanish croquette. The Spanish croquette! The Spanish croquette! Oh, I want croquettes now. Oh, yeah. Can, where, where are the croquettes? I kind of, I kind of smelled them. You do? What about churros? Did you have churros, churros growing up as yeah. a kid? Oh, con chocolate. Oh, with chocolate and cinnamon and sugar? Mm, just chocolate. Oh, is that an American thing? I guess, yeah. Americans, you just add the extra, extra stuff to everything. We just have the chocolate con, uh, churro con chocolate, that's it. Yeah, I mean, Taco Bell has a pizza taco or whatever that's called. What's the thing that Doja Cat always wants to get bring back? The pizza pie or whatever? I don't know. I'm like, that's, I'm pretty sure it's not Mexican. <laughs> you know, Americans always finesse everything. I'm telling you. Extra seasoned. Extra salt. salt butter. Butter. Oh, and I love me some sugar. butter. Sugar. You know, this year I started cooking with butter. Normally I don't. I eat like a, I used to eat like a bunny rabbit. Uh, but something happens when you live alone. You're just Good like, days. you just want to start experimenting with different yeah. things. And wow. I mean, took my food to the next level, butter. <laughs> like butter changed the game for me. And it also changed uh, my weight. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe next year we'll go a little bit uh, easy on the butter. Um, but how you been, babes? Not bad, not bad. St not stressed. I was going to say stressed, but um, busy. I know, we're both so darn busy. This, uh, you guys don't know this, obviously, but we started the podcast three hours late. <laughs> <laughs> we're late. Claire and I are notoriously always late. Uh, we should probably get better at that if we want to be with the major leagues. Probably, yeah. You know what I mean? If we want to be where... Our people are, people that we know intimately. We should probably work on that, you know. But uh, we're here now. And before we, you know, turned on the cameras and pressed record, Clarita, you were saying something to me that... Oh, yeah, what we were talking about. We always do this. Like, we get together and it's like, oh, da, da, da. Stop, 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 stop. Save it for camera. Wait, and no, then no, we no, start no, recording no. and I don't even remember what we were talking Wait, about. Wait, no, 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 no. I actually don't do that. I will put I my foot down. You do that. I, do I, that. I, I don't like doing stop, that. Stop, stop, save it. But then we don't. I'm from the, from the camp of people that I, my ideas aren't that precious and they'll always come. Just like a song. The reason That's why I want. you're a creative person. Uh, not, so the moment something comes, it's like, hold it. No, there are creative people who are also like this, oh. but I just, I'm a, I know that I'm going to come up with another idea. Fair enough. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying. Okay. But, but this thing in particular, I thought would be anything that I think the Bible babes may be interested in, like hearing two friends talk about. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, let's, let's wait for the mics. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to try and jog your memory here. Okay. okay? <laughs> Clara had said to me. And we'll delete this. We'll edit this out if you don't want it okay. to reveal it. That's all right. You said, sometimes it feels like you're only successful when it comes to taking on other people's. Uh, kind of, yeah. Paraphrasing. So said, you can say. I feel like I commit more to projects when they belong to someone else. That's what And that's said. fucked up. Because then I'll never make enough of myself, you know? Always... 
And then I told you that's not true. Like, yeah. I mean, you have other, th you have so much, so much going on for you and then your nails and stuff. And then, and then, oh yeah, then that's when I said, I'm at a journey right now working with my therapist where I'm trying to tap in with my inner emotions and like understand why things happen in my life. Like the part that depends on me, like why, you know the thought process goes there or whatever, why my brain decides to act this way. And then I was telling you that I want to do hypnosis, but I'm not sure how to find someone that I can trust, that it's like a, a well-renowned, you know, professional or whatever. And I was, I, I was actually asking you if you knew someone, but... Well, Clara, actually, while I say what I'm going to say, can you look up what hypnosis is? Yeah. So there is someone from uh, someone in a, that I know who's a comic and who I don't know personally, but I know people who know her and we can get this information for you. But Annie <laughs> Letterman, she's one third of the Trash Tuesday podcast, which I've mentioned before. Mm -hmm. She is a huge advocate for hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And she said that it she she's sober she now. It? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sure. So and we can find a way to get to her, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like to Definitely. find out what it was. And she goes to this specific person in Los Angeles who she like is constantly but I actually he may he may have a course that's universal or something. I'm not too sure. But can you give us what the definition of hypnosis sure. is? Hypnosis also refers well, to therapy. Hypnotherapy or hypnotic suggestion is a trans like Oh, no, not trans. How do you? <laughs> Trance? How do you pronounce trans -like. it? Trance-like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Trance-like state in which you have heightened it, focus and concentration. It's usually done with the help of a therapist using verbal repetition and mental images. Wait, mm. that wasn't very clear. No, yes, it was. Because when you think of hypnosis, you think of it's a like magician in a top hat. It's like semi-conscious. It's like you're in a state of like semi-consciousness. And a therapist kind of helps walk you through your subconscious and like old memories that you're like every day. Okay. I just realized I'm showing both hands. It's okay. Guys, this is what happens when you're a nail tech doing three jobs. Okay. You don't yeah, have time to finish it. But, but also show us the good nail. Only the YouTube people can I see this, but she's showing off her new nails that are so uh, beautiful. Okay, back to hypnotism. Anyway, um, you are um, semi-conscious and the therapist is helping uh, walk you through like your subconscious and whatever trauma you may have from the past or not necessarily trauma, just, you know, like deeper shit that you cannot just tap consciously by yourself. And, I've, I and you feel that maybe this form of like in this immersive kind of therapy mm -hmm will help uh, unpack some kind of... Yeah, I think it would definitely help me unpack... Um, self-worth? Self, no, no self-worth, but like self-understanding of who I am and why I act or feel the way that I do. But also, I don't know, like I find it fascinating. You know me, I, I, I love... I find very fascinating the way that the brain works and operates. And I've been wanting to do this for a minute, like for a few years now. My, my mom's a therapist in Spain and she, she knows how to do hypnosis. Never done it on me that I know of, but, but no, I don't think she would. I want to try every type of therapy. I'm so into it. Well, why don't you try the Holy Spirit? No, that's, that was bad. That was bad. That was, that was one knock for me. I'm sorry, guys. Cause babe, look at me, Clara. I got the Holy Spirit, and I'm still <laughs> <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, uh, wow! I can't find a video, but I'm I'm sure whatever. it's not this. It, whatever, it doesn't whatever, work whatever. like that. Oh man, I I've been there. I I feel like I'm there right now. Like I I see. I feel so intimately. You and I are like we said this before. Like oh, we we share so much of the same. Uh, I don't know. Um, feelings about maybe career and you know what but, I mean yeah, life whatever. life now and and sometimes it feels kind of comforting to know that a you're not alone but also b to have someone have eyes outside of yourself to also see or be able to remind you of all the things that you are uh 
building, mm. you know? You're not going to feel it right now, but oh, that's the thing about self-building, though. Those you can't see. and you know, You'll never be able to see it. You know what I mean? Like, with the stuff within, mm. not just co a career, profession, those material things, the things that you can see tangibly in front of you, but, like, the internal work. Right. <sighs> Oof, I don't know. Did you know what I just... I'm going to butcher this insight, but what is it? I uh, scrolled past a TikTok of a man saying that, did you know that antidepressants are, I probably shouldn't say this because I don't have the data to back it up, but. We got go, -Go right here. Take this how you will. Uh, it's about the efficacy of antidepressants oh. and how essentially they're really more for people with uh, severe uh, treatment resistant depression oh. and those with medium to fair levels of depression the medicine is in exercise sleep and water That's so they've mine. found and they almost find that medicine for those people in the in the realm of uh low to to medium severity in depression medicine proves to be and give them adverse symptoms or nothing at all Whereas the people with severe, severe uh, uh, treatment-resistant depression feel the benefits of these um, SSRIs or uh, different forms of antidepressants. I mean, I'm not surprised. I, I'm always pro using chemical pills or whatever as the very last resort. Mm -hmm. Even like for a headache, I'd rather deal with a headache, drink more water that day, whatever, then, like I say, putting shit in my body. Now you can go ahead and give me that Tylenol, Advil, extra strength, whatever you need. All right, guys, before we dive into this week's story, there are a few house announcements. I was perusing our YouTube and TikTok numbers, and I saw that we had an influx of new Bible babes. Bible babes, welcome the people. Welcome them, please. If they have questions in the comments, please help them out. Uh, because of this, I wanted to just give us a brief rundown of who we are, what the show is, yada, yada, yada. If you've been here for a year, sorry about it, but this is for the new kids, okay? So every five-ish episodes, we get an influx of people, like I just said, who are confused about what this show is all about, because apparently the title isn't enough. <laughs> this is a fun and fab Bible storytelling visual podcast told by me, Brianda. An ex-atheist, now born-again Christian and actress that struggles to get work. Uh, we also sprinkle in fun commentary from one of our podcast producers, our very own resident unbeliever, Clara, the Spanish croquette. <laughs> and each week, we tell stories from the Bible in the chronological order in which the Holy Bible was written. March 2021, we embarked on our biblical quest with the book of Genesis. But please know, this iteration of the show will end upon the book's completion, scheduled sometime around 2023. Don't say I didn't warn you. So the best way to consume our content is to keep up with your own personal readings, okay? The exact book and chapter will always be found in every episode's show description. Or you can just watch leisurely and stay for the chit chats like 70% of you do because I can see those analytics. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Our content is evergreen, meaning that if you decide to take this program seriously at a later date, like, I don't know, 2032 when Will Smith is allowed back at the Oscars, this show will still be here for you. Okay. <laughs> Today, uh, we are right around the time of the Book of Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah, that time frame. And we're, we currently find ourselves around the destruction of the corrupt northern kingdom of Israel and Judah. That's right. God gave a green light for enemy nations to bring this corrupt nation down. And you know what? I'm stressed. You're stressed. Everybody's stressed. But don't be too stressed. Because the Lord gave us prophetic books like Isaiah, or this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. These books are there to help us 
They promise that after the Lord's judgment, both Israel and Judah will be restored and be even better than before. Capiche? Was that a lot of information? Mm-mm. Okay. That's good. Well, we'll be doing that every 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Cleaning up shop, just making sure we're all organized. <laughs> Not 15 minutes, 15 episodes. Oh, 15 episodes. <laughs> so some people really do need that reminder, though. <laughs> now let's get into the story. Today, we will be covering Isaiah chapters 18 to 24. And we pick up where we left off with Isaiah delivering 15 total oracles to pagan nations surrounding Judah. Last week, we brushed on Isaiah delivering oracles to Babylon, Assyria, Philistia, Moab, and Damascus. Check out this episode right here. But today, we start with an oracle to the nation of Cush. Stoners, get your head out of the gutter. (laughs) Cush is modern-day Ethiopia. Hi, Tangi. This is going to be a good hi, Tangi. What is it? I know you're going to love this one because when I found out, I was like, (gasps) I have a hi, Tangi, on Ethiopia. Did you know that Ethiopia and Liberia are the two only countries in Africa who are not colonized? Oh, shoot. That Mm -hmm. is fire. I know. And then wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. Did you know uh, TikTok? Gosh, I got to spend more time off TikTok, but it's great for things like this. Because of this, maybe that may be why Ethiopia does not go by the Gregorian character, like um, calendar, Oh, the Gregorian calendar, like the rest of the world. So it's 2022 right now and everywhere else in the world. In Ethiopia, they're like eight years behind. Ethiopians what? have a, wait, Ethiopians oh, have, yeah. oh, I love this. I know, Ethiopians have, um, you know, we have 12 months in the year. Yeah. They have 13 months. <gasps> And and then some change because of the, some kind of like leap year situation that happens. So it goes accruing every year. That's yeah. so in- I didn't know that. I didn't know it either. Wait, you said Ethiopia and Liberia? Liberia. Well, I know that Ethiopia. What about Egypt? Who colonized Egypt? Uh, uh, Europeans. I don't know. Where, that's why they're like, there's a blend there. Mediterraneans. There's some kind of Middle Eastern. Didn't they? No. Egypt? No. You're, ta- you're thinking about Turkey. Oh, I am thinking about Turkey, but Turkey's not in Africa. I'm talking about colonization in Africa because Morocco was colonized by the French. For sure. Uh, What about Egypt? Yeah, look up. Look that up. Ooh, look at us. Educational babes. Oh, the British. Motherfucker. Yeah, so I was right. Oh, European. Yeah, you're right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, and that's why there are a lot love of love for my UK people, but <sighs> yeah, they put their paws on everything. Just... That's why in 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 uh, Egypt you see that there's a lot of people that are fair skinned and like right and light eyes. And the... No, 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 no. I'm, it's all making sense. Mm-hmm. They were we... colonized yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, anywho, uh, Kush is basically where modern day Ethiopia is. Uh, Clara, put a map here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kush calls out for help. Because they hear about what's to come from what Isaiah is telling them. You know, they know that what's going on with their neighbors. And so they say, please, what do we do? Help us out, blah, blah, blah. And Isaiah tells them, listen, buckle up and seek repentance. Because the Lord is cutting the fat. But he's preventing another spread of corruption. All right? And of course, please remember, this is the Old Testament times. The last year of Bible stories, we've been only in the Old Testament. Please remember, I am a Christian, so the Old Testament is only half of my Holy Bible. Mm. And, you know, Jesus, as we know him from the New Testy, uh, uh, he is our Lord, okay? And Jesus begged for God the Father to have mercy on the people, to know, have mercy on us all. They know not what they do, right? And so that's why we believe that Jesus was sacrificed. Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected three days later. Yeah, yeah, you guys know the bit, the whole bit, yeah, right? So uh, I just know that when we're talking about the destruction that the Lord um, uh, was delivering messages to through Isaiah, just know that it was all restorative. I, I've said this 20 million times so far in the last 10 episodes. It's because it's in the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, it's worth repeating. Destruction happening. Yes, 
It's been greenlit by the Lord. But at the other side of this destruction will be a new land. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. I will say it again. Not right this second, but next week I will probably say it again. <laughs> All right. Let's get into some scripture to hear more about what Isaiah told Cush in his oracle. Isaiah chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. Woe to the land of whirring wings along the rivers of Cush, which sends envoys by sea in papyrus boats over the water. Go swift messengers to a people tall and smooth-skinned, to a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech, whose land is divided by rivers. All you people of the world, you who live in the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, you will see it, and when a trumpet sounds, you will hear it. This is what the Lord says to me. I, re I will remain quiet and will look on from my dwelling place, like shimmering heat in the sunlight like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. A poet. For before the harvest, when the blossom is gone and the flowers become a ripening grape, he will cut off the shoots with pruning knives and cut down and take away the spreading branches. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. Oh, I love this. Bible study. Bible study with Bree. Okay. So there's so much here. Go swift messengers to, to a people tall and smooth skinned, to a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by rivers. Here you're now, the Lord is now, he's talking to Cush, the, the modern day Ethiopia, but he's referring to you see all these other people who speak this foreign language. Make sure to send that message, the message that I'm telling you and that's making you guys scared right now. Make sure you send that message. Help your brothers out is essentially what he's saying here. Let's go to verse five. For before the harvest, when the blossom is gone and the flowers become ripening grape, he, he will cut off the shoots with pruning knives and cut down and take away the spreading branches. It reminds me of uh, a, a mini high tangy here, but you know, um, when it comes to Twitter and tweets, I don't mm -hmm. know if anyone's on Twitter here, but Twitter is like society's virtual uh, uh, court square at scale where people get to co uh, congregate and uh, bring their pitchforks and complain or, 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 or say positive things, whatever. But the second there's a drop of negative or something, it spreads. He, the Lord is cutting it off to prevent that expansion, mm -hmm. to cut down and take away the spreading branches. Bible babes, think about that. Meditate on that a bit. If you have anything to add, please drop it in our uh, comments below. Now, chapter 19, Isaiah is going to Hit up the Egyptians, babe. Now, y'all know from Genesis and Exodus that the land of Egypt and the Lord go way back. We know that Egypt was the Mark Zuckerberg of ancient nations, one of the richest men and also very advanced. Does that make sense? Yep. Fully I mean, right. he is. He's, make, he's building meta. He's literally building another universe. That's what the Egyptians were like. That's yep. how advanced they were in the ancient times. Yep. However, Egypt had a history with being racist towards Israelites and enslaving them for centuries. And the Lord ain't forget about that. The Lord is coming for them hard. All right? He really breaks this down in scripture, which is way better than anything that I have to say. Okay? So let's, let's go to some scripture. Clara, am I okay? I feel like I can't speak. I don't feel anything wrong with your speech. Okay. Okay. Maybe you feel it because you feel the struggle, but I'm like, what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, there's no glitch anywhere. Let's hop into some scripture to read more about the oracle given by Isaiah to the Egyptians. It's going to be Isaiah chapter 19, verses 3 to 18. This is a long one, so get your snacks. The Egyptians will lose heart and will bring their plans to nothing. They will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master, and a fierce king will rule over them. 
declares the Lord the Lord Almighty. The waters of the rivers will dry up, and the riverbed will be parched and dry. The canals will stink. The streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. The reeds and rushes will wither. Also, the plants along the Nile, at the mouth of the river, every sown field along the Nile will become parched, will blow away and be no more. The fishermen will groan and lament, all who cast hooks into the Nile. Those who throw nets on the water will pine away. Those who work with combed flax will despair. The weavers of fine linen will lose hope. The workers in cloth will be dejected, and all the wage earners will be sick at heart. The officials of Zoan are nothing but fools. The wise counselors of Pharaoh give senseless advice. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am one of the wise men, a disciple of the ancient kings? Huh, where are the wise men now? Let them show you and make known what the Lord Almighty has planned against Egypt. The officials of Zoan have become fools. The leaders of Memphis. Memphis? Oh, <laughs> Memphis, Tennessee? Oh, I want to live there one day. Okay. The officials of Zoan have become fools. The leaders of Memphis are deceived. The cornerstones of her peoples have led Egypt astray. The Lord has poured into them a spirit of dizziness. Oof. They make Egypt stagger in all that she does as a drunkard staggers around in his vomit. There is nothing Egypt can do, head or tail, palm branch or reed. Wow. In that day, the Egyptians will become weaklings. They will shudder with fear at the uplifted hand that the Lord Almighty raises against them. Oof, the Lord is mad. And the land of Judah will bring terror to the Egyptians. Everyone to whom Judah is mentioned will be terrified because of what the Lord Almighty is planning against them. In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the City of the Sun, Oh, whew, there's a reason why I wanted to go in on this one. Here, Isaiah is telling Egypt, not only are you guys going to suffer, but you will be speaking the Canaan language, meaning the things that you did to those Israelites, the way you oppressed the Israelites, they're going to oppress you back tenfold. Here we have, the Lord has poured into them a spirit of dizziness. They make Egypt stagger in all that she does as a drunkard staggers around in his vomit. Whatever Egypt uh, uh, vomits out, whatever toxicity, whatever that is that they need in order to feel better, they're going to vomit, right? And then the Lord's going to make them struggle in their own vomit. In their own weaknesses. We get uh, it. This, okay, visuals. Hey, man, Israel likes the visuals. <laughs> uh, and and lastly, we know that the Egyptians, if they're the Mark Zuckerbergs of the ancient time, right? That would that would mean that they are smart, wise. Here we're saying we're not only going to make you unwise, we're going to make you guys uh, uh, confused within each other's wisdom and mm. cause strife in that way. Mm -hmm. That oracle was pretty scary for Egypt. I don't know. And then later on in that episode, he even says that Egypt and Assyria will uh, work together for Yahweh, you know, at like kind of like an interwoven multicultural family. But that's at the end of chapter 19, if you guys want to, if you guys want to li uh, listen to it. Or I'll just say it right now. Isaiah chapter 23 verses, <laughs> uh, chapter 19 verses 23 to 25. Uh, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Hallelujah. Oh, man, that's kind of cool. That's really cool. 
The end of chapter 19 is really fun. Please read that one, guys. Not fun. You guys know what I'm saying. It's really insightful. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, now we are at chapter 20. And woo-wee! Isaiah is now going to address Cush and Egypt. And guess what? He has brought out his Oh my God, I'm so sorry. No, sorry. Cut that out. No, no. But no, but he did bring out his but I don't want to say this. I mean, we can cut this. Cut that, Clara. Okay, we're here. Okay. Um, and, and Isaiah is in his sackcloth and his buns are out. That's a little more appropriate. Yep. Okay. Okay. Chapter 20, the prophecy is for Egypt and Cush. And Isaiah is now at the part of his TED Talk where a 3D slide presentation comes on to really bring this prophecy of those nations coming undone on home. Coming on home, we're coming on home. Jesus, we're coming home. <laughs> Jesus, I wish you'd come back so that I didn't have to uh, cry every time I don't know what's the next thing I'm gonna say. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate it. I hate it here. Let's go back to Memphis. <laughs> um, I wrote a song called Bust to Boston. Bust to Boston. I'm not going to sing it. Sorry. Um, let's do it. Okay. Uh, scripture. Brianna, we got this. Chapter 20. Where am I looking? Let's dive into some scripture. Isaiah chapter 20, verses 2 to 5. At that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos. He said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so, going around stripped and barefoot. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign important against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away stripped and barefoot the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. Those who trusted in Cush and boasted in Egypt will be dismayed and put to shame. Wow. Uh, anytime you see someone in the Bible uh, wearing sackcloth, that means that their wife died, their husband died, their child mm -hmm. died, they're in mourning. Oh, okay. So Isaiah is revealing all of this that the Lord is making him say, right? That is inspiring him to say to them. And he is so depressed about it. He's He's so sad about it. This doesn't bring him joy. Mm -hmm. So much so that it surpasses mourning it surpasses pain he's now at the point of what's on the other side of it some people say anger right well guess what humiliation like he's humiliated mm. to the point that he took the sackcloth off and now he's naked he was naked for three years giving this prophecy do you understand and if if i may it kind of allows us to see the lord told him to do these things so in that sense, it's he serves as like, I don't want to say theatrics because that's uh, doesn't convey what I'm trying to say, but it shows just how sensitive Isaiah was to the Lord's word. Like to do that and for three years? Right. I don't know, man. He just did this to show his state of mourning, the Lord's state of mourning. We should, at least as Christians, we should try and embody Jesus, even though we'll always fall short, mm. but he's the, that, that we, we, we want to rid ourselves of this and be more like the perfect North star, right? So here you have Isaiah trying to be that image that the Lord wants him to be so that they can see what the state, current state the Lord is in, mm. right? This doesn't bring the Lord any kind of gun ho joy, right? Mm. Um, and again, to do that for three years, the commitment, the commitment that these prophets, these prophets had for the Lord, I wish I could, man, I want to love the Lord with that level of de dedication and I want to commit. I don't want to get naked around New York City. <laughs> I'm sure more than one would love it. Okay, well, so. <laughs> listen, listen, not with these tetas. Imagine me Especially running around with, with those tetas. tetas. No, uh, I would literally just be walking super slow because if I ran, my titty would give me a black eye. <laughs> Stop. 
Okay, chapter 21. <laughs> chapter 21 has prophecies against Babylon, Edom, and Arabia. If you guys remember from last episode, we know that Isaiah had already given Babylon a prophecy, an oracle, but he did it again, and it got even spicier. He uh, uh, describes the Lord's uh, physical ailments, the physical pains that he's ex experiencing uh, uh, due to their uh, sin and uh, their corrupt ways. Chapter 21, I would encourage you all to go on and read that. But for now, we're going to dive right into chapter 22, because it's a long book and there are 66 chapters and we have places to be. <laughs> oh God, real ones know where that came from. Um, no, but really, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough read. Like, I'm not going to say a scripture. I'll just say this one. The Lord says, at this, my body is racked with pain. Pangs seize me like those of a woman in labor. I'm staggered by what I hear. I am bewildered by what I see. That was from chapter 21. Just giving Did them a taste. Did you read that already? Mm -mm. Last week or something? No, uh, I didn't. He did talk about labor, though. He talked about woman's labor before, right? Okay. That's the level of pain that the Lord is talking about. Chapter 21, guys. Where's my camera? Like, whatever you want. Isaiah chapter 21, guys. It gets gruesome. Uh, Old Testament. That old testy will do it. All right. Chapter 22. Chapter 22. Now we're done. Finit. That concludes the oracles to pagan nations. And we are back to prophecies for the people of Judah. And like we've said before, the punishment when you are his children is more severe because they are held to a different standard. And if you guys thought Isaiah was depressed when the Lord was giving him an oracle to say to pagan nations, imagine how gutted Isaiah felt when he had to tell Jerusalem some prophecies. All right? He let them know that Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed, and there's nothing that any of them can do to stop it. And when Isaiah is there confirming what's about to, to happen to the people, um, they were sobbing in pain, you know? And what do you think Judah did? You think Judah repented? You think maybe they spent, like, sacred time with their family during the, the, end, of the end of days, right? You think they would do something like that, right? Mm. No. The people of Judah was, were hearing Isaiah say that the end is coming. It's already started. Buckle up. And they celebrated. Oh, what? Why are you? <gasps> That's God. That is God. That is God. I'm literally sweating. That's what that's what happens when you celebrate when the Lord is talking to you serious. I'm telling you, stop messing around. Or maybe that's the Lord talking to me. Like, stop being so jokey, jokey. Now let's hop into some scripture to see what Isaiah had to say about these trifling uh, Jerusalem uh, natives who are celebrating at the news of their own demise. Huh. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 22, verses 12 to 13. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, called you on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth. But see, there is joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. That's what they're saying. They're saying, we're dying anyways. We might as well eat and drink. <laughs> of course, Clara would laugh at that. That's depressing. That's so depressing. That's, that's funny because that's a little bit how I approach life. Like, if you really don't have anything that you can do about it, might as well just enjoy whatever you got left, you know what I mean? Okay. If you're going to die anyway. I want to put on a sackcloth right now. <laughs> Lord, please have mercy on my friend. Lord. She does not know, but I love my sister. I love her a lot, and I'm going to stick beside her. <laughs> I love her to pieces. <laughs> she, 
Oh, Lord. Anyways, there's a palace leader in Jerusalem at this time during when the people in Judah are celebrating. Uh, he was a palace leader who, of course, commissioned all of them to celebrate. You know, if all if you have a whole city of people celebrating, that had to have been, I guess, biblical ancient times, the government's being like, yeah, let's just do that. Right. So Isaiah hits up the palace leader named Shenba and was like, you, you know what? I'm going to replace you. He says that later on in uh, chapter 22, if you guys want to go and um, read that. Uh, specifically, it'll be around verses 15 to 20. Uh, uh, I guess I'll say it. This is me. I always say I'm not going to read the scripture, and then I always want to. But in chapter 22, verse 20, when Isaiah approaches Shenba, telling him, Ayo, you ain't ish, and I'm going to replace you. In verse 20, he says, in that day... Uh, uh, when Jerusalem is to be restored again. In that day, I will summon my servant, uh, Eliakim. I think it's Eliakim, son of Helika, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and the people of Judah. I see Jesus in all of this. It's so funny when you, the more you read the text, the more you read the word, you see that Jesus is all over the Old Testament too. And I don't mean to, you know, obviously, I don't want to be disrespectful to any of our Jewish audiences, audience listening. But what can I say? That's my truth and I'm sticking to it. We're now at chapter 23. And this prophecy is for Tyre and Sidian. Tyre is thought to be one of the oldest cities of the Phoenician coast, established long before the Israelites entered the land of Canaan. Isaiah affirms Tyre's ancient origins as, quote-unquote, from days of old. The name Tyre, Zor in Hebrew, signifies a rock, an apt description for the rocky coastal fortress. In ancient times, Tyre flourished as a maritime city and a busy center for commercial trade. The area's most valuable export was its then world-famous purple dye. And originally, the ancient city was divided into two parts. An older port city, Old Tyre, located on the mainland in a small rocky island about a half mile off the coast. And uh, could you imagine that kind of prophecy to a area that was that important to not just their own nation, but the whole world uh, uh, it would cause a ripple effect of destruction, which leads us to chapter 24, where Isaiah gives a prophecy to the whole world. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I want to start us off with some scripture to, you know, uh, get her, get the wheels turning for us. Um, because the only other time we know about the Lord prophesying about the world's destruction uh, was what, back in Genesis during, after the, the, the great flood? You know, with Noah, where he said, I, I will never do this again. There will be no other reset. Well, he said it wouldn't be by water. But by reading the scripture, you can kind of infer that the next time there will be a reset, it would be like fire and earthquakes. If you read the book of Revelations, but that's later, later on in the episode. I mean, uh, later on in the life of Bible stories. Let's jump into some scripture to hear more about Isaiah's prophecy for the rest of the world. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 17 to 23. Terror and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. He who flees at the sound of the terror shall fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows of heaven are opened, and the foundations of the earth tremble. The earth is utterly broken. The earth is split apart. The earth is violently shaken. Yeah, 
earthquake. The earth staggers like a drunken man. It sways like a hut. Its transgression lies heavy upon it, and it falls and will not rise again. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison, and after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Yeah. Here we we have Isaiah kind of prophesying the end of the earth. It's so nutty, these apocalyptic chapters. Just, like, they don't, oh, this is going to sound nutty, but when you believe in God, as a God-fearing person myself, I can only speak for myself, right? And I'm, maybe my Bible babes will can attest to this, but it doesn't bring about terror to me. It doesn't make me, like, fear, like, shaking my boots. Like, if anything, it reminds me of the fact that we're still here today. Despite all of this that he said, and despite what he has already done, we're still here today. We're still in a studio in New York City. I'm here with my good friend, Clara. Uh, you're listening to this podcast today because you're living with breath in your lungs. We're here right now. So what are these apocalyptic prophecies about? And how is the Lord working through these prophets that were inspired by his word to then tell us about the end of the world? Where is God? Where is God in the story? Well, I guess that brings us to this week's moral of the story. Moral of the story is God works in us, through us, for us. If we shift our views away from what he can do for us to what he has already done for us, we'll allow the spirit of God to fine tune us in ways that will only result in deep peace. Will it be comfortable getting there? Probs not, babes. I mean, the Lord was tearing the earth up in them oracles. But it would all be restorative, remember? This history of redemption can be summed up in a later chapter of Isaiah, chapter 58, verse 8. The prophet says, Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. In order for the Lord to work on us, we must first acknowledge and trust in his power to do so. If you hire someone to do repairs in your kitchen, you got to learn about them, right? You got to trust them and let him do his work. But this, this repair man built that kitchen. You know what I'm saying? So he definitely knows what tools to bring. And God doesn't give up on us. I mean, we're still here, aren't we? For now. <gasps> Ooh! Hey, Father. How'd I do? Yeah, I got the hint with the falling plant. I mean, what was going on there? I'm sorry. Is my irreverence a little disrespectful? I'm sorry. If it's not me, I'll tone it down for next week. But I'm doing what I can with what I got. All right? Can't, uh, you said to come as you are. I'm coming as I am. Mm -hmm.